All right, well, let's pray, and then we can get into the Word. Father, thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for your love for us, your grace to us. Thank you for uh, the worship, that we could praise you, and that you would honor us in your presence, speaking directly to you, to praise you for who you are. We pray that you minister to us through your word this morning, and you encourage us as we go into the the Christmas week and the Christmas season here. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, as you can see, we are starting a two-week series in Philippians chapter 2 today titled A True Family Christmas. So we'll be in this, Philippians 2, this week we'll be in verses 1 through 4, and next week we will be in verses 5 through 11. Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. So each year my extended family gets together for uh, annual Christmas Eve celebration, and there's like 30 or 40 of us who get together now, and uh, we we have, you know, lights up, decorations, we got the fireplace going, it's all warm, and we give gifts to one another, we have food, you know, it's a lot of fun, we play games, we have live music, um, I'm kind of the, the runt of the litter in my family as a musician, uh, we, I have like professional quality musicians in my family, so I'm just trying to keep up when we're playing live music. But but it's it's a lot of fun. And the first the first Christmas that Morgan came to, she said it was like a, a Hallmark movie. It was because it's such a stereotypical <laughs> Christmas that you like seeing a movie with the music going and all the games and stuff. But I always look forward to this time of year uh, and all the family gatherings that I get to be a part of. I just love uh, gathering with the family and enjoying such such great celebrations on Christmas and around Christmas. Well, it's it's interesting to think of my family gatherings through the lens of scripture and from Jesus's perspective. Cuz Jesus, he respected his own birth family and he honored uh, his, and enjoyed being with his own birth family, but he had an additional perspective that he valued his eternal family even greater than his uh, birth family that he was born into on the earth. We read, we read when, when we were going through the book of Luke uh, that we just finished two weeks ago, we read in chapter 8 when, when Jesus' family came to see him, Starting in verse 20, it says, And it was told to Jesus by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. So, so Jesus valued the family that he was born into, but he valued his eternal family, which he defined as those who follow God, he valued that eternal family even more. So Jesus' perspective on family, it doesn't cheapen my experience in my family that I love, and, and it doesn't cheapen my experience in the Christmas Eve celebration that we do at all. What it does is it says that this family gathering that we're in with my eternal family is even more joyful than the experience that I experience every year and that I look forward to honestly throughout I look forward to my family Christmas Eve throughout the entire year I I look forward to that and in the moment I'm thinking man I gotta savor this moment because I don't get this for a whole nother year right uh what what this tells me it doesn't take anything away from that what this what Jesus's perspective tells me is that this moment right here that we're in right in this moment gathering as our church family is is even more joyful than what I experience every year on Christmas Eve. So uh, I think even more, or especially for those of us who don't or aren't blessed with these types of family gatherings, I think the church even even more so is is an amazing place where we can experience that family gathering together. So this Sunday and next Sunday, we'll be looking at our church family 
here at Calvary Stockton. And we'll be looking at our church family through the lens of Jesus' perspective. We're seeing how Christmas, or the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, how that expands how we think about the relationship between the church and our lives, or our, our relationship to our church here at Calvary Stockton. So as we're going through this week's first four verses, we're focused on this being a loving church family. And we'll, we'll start reading in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So our passage this morning is a response to the ending of Philippians chapter 1, which talks about suffering. So we expect to suffer for and with Christ as a part of our ministry to and with Christ. Now, this is not uh, unfamiliar, even though we didn't read through Philippians chapter 1. This isn't unfamiliar for us because we, finishing the book of Luke two weeks ago, we saw Christ himself suffer through the the cross and through his ministry to the earth. And then after he suffered and rose again, we heard him, heard Christ, invite us to join him in his ministry on this earth. That we would serve with him in ministry on this earth and we would even suffer with him in ministry on this earth like we're soldiers on the front line of a battle. That's how we ended the book of Luke. So this makes sense to us, and we expect for serving the Lord to include us serving through personal suffering. Now, as we get to verse 1, Paul, the author of the book, lists five unique blessings that he assumes we've already received from Christ. So we'll go through them one by one. The first thing that Paul mentions in verse 1 is consolation in Christ, or an encouraging answer and, and this holds the weight of this, this encouraging answer is coming from a, a messianic comforter. That's what the nation of Israel was waiting for, a, a savior who would come and comfort that nation. So an encouraging answer from a messianic comforter. An example of this in our own like personal lives would be when we're praying to God really, really hard for him to come through for us. And then he does come through for us. That feeling that you get when you spent so long praying for God to come through for you, and then he, he does, that feeling is like this, this messianic comforter who's uh, consoling us. The second thing Paul mentions is comfort in love. This is a persuasive comfort through divine love that's rooted in God himself. An example of this is when God relieves you of your burdens beyond your own understanding. Where you, you know, you're weighed down by something. Your mind is cloudy with, or, or your shoulders are heavy with a burden that you've been carrying in your life or a struggle that you have in your life. And you don't know how to get this thing off your back. But somehow the Lord takes that burden away from you. And that feeling of that burden being lifted off your shoulders, of your mind becoming less cloudy and, and clear, that, that burden, that's the comfort of the love of God. Now, the third thing mentioned in verse 1 is fellowship of the Spirit. Sharing a committed and intimate partnership with God. An example is when God helps direct you and guide you and grow you in the gifts that he's given you. So as you serve him, as you go through your life and God directs you and, and grows you in the gifts that he's given you, that's part of the fellowship or the relationship that we have with God through the Spirit. Fourth thing mentioned in verse 1 is affection. This is deep inward care, like, like from your gut, like from your bowels, deep care, deep affection. An example is when you can tell God went out of his way to do something for you, to care for you. Like, you know, 
God's plan could continue without giving you the care that you need, but you know God went out of his way to specifically care for you or specifically speak to you. The fifth thing mentioned is mercy, an emotional compassion and sympathy. An example of this is when God's heart breaks for you, when God's heart breaks for your broken heart. Now, verse 1 assumes that we've received these five blessings from God as a part of our faith, as a part of us coming to faith in Christ and then following him. We first experience these things from God himself, and then we learn to treat other people the same way, with the same blessings. This is the type of people that live in our church family, that exists in our church family. Our church family is made up of people who have received these five blessings from God and who desire to share those blessings with each other, to share those blessings with you and me and those sitting next to you. If you've, if you've ever seen a uh, trapeze artist, I think that's what they're called. They, they fly around on the wires and the, the poles in the air, right? They're like at circuses and stuff like that. So if you've ever seen them practice, they have the giant net underneath them. So they're flipping around 50 feet in the air or whatever. And if they fall, they just kind of get absorbed into this net and they're fine and they hop back up and they go back and they try it again. And they do it over and over again until they get so good at flying through the air that they don't need the net anymore. And then they're, they're good enough to where they can um, perform those, those things in front of a live audience. So we learn to live in the love of God with the safety net of his consolation, his comfort, his fellowship, his affection, and his mercy. Living in the love of God is a complicated, or it's hard, or we're not necessarily good at it. And so we learn to follow God with this giant saf- safety net of these blessings. And this, the, the safety net is, is from God. These blessings are from God, but they're also shared with our local church. In other words, you're going through your Christian walk and you will stumble. We expect to stumble. We expect to mess up. We expect to say the wrong thing. We expect to do the wrong thing. We expect to mess up in our lives. And we're trying to seek the Lord, but we're stumbling along the way. And guess what is there to catch us? These blessings from God that we just, we just mentioned. And guess who's sharing those blessings with us? This church that we're a part of is here to help hold on to that safety net, to help catch us when we stumble and when we fall and when we mess up and when we're not perfect. I remember early in my faith being a real challenge to my church leadership where I would you know, kind of contradict everything that they said or challenge everything that they said, see if I could catch them in in, uh, any mistakes or catch them doing anything wrong or saying anything wrong. Or, you know, I made sure to tell them when uh, their decisions were bad decisions and and how they should have done it right. And, And that whole time that I'm just really hard on them, you know, they're gracious with me, they're caring, they listen to me, they hear me out. And they, they try to understand what I'm saying, and, and they give me more grace than I deserve. So, so now I, I get the joy of being able to share that with, with others who are equally as challenging to me and uh, get to be gracious with others of the church. That was a joke, but only two people got it. Everybody else was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean I'm a challenge? How dare you, Pastor, tell me? that I'm a challenge. (laughs) God and the church love us when we're at our best and when we're at our worst. And that's the job of the church here as a family is to love each other when we're at our best or our worst or anywhere in between. And thinking about it, 
I don't know of any environment that is not only like this loving and caring, but also seeks to be more loving and caring. So admittedly, the church isn't perfect at this, isn't always good at this. Sometimes we feel that a church is, uh, or our church here, might not be so loving and, and not, might not be catching us when we fall, might be pushing us down harder, might be a challenge to us. But the thing is, is, is that applies to this as well, meaning that as a church we're not perfect and we're giving each other grace in order to give each other more grace. Like, like sometimes we, we haven't given each other enough grace, so we give our, each other more grace to give ourselves more time to get more grace on top of grace. That, that I don't know of another, I mean, I think like when I'm at work, I feel like th- the people in my work care about me, but ultimately like we need to get a job done that makes money for the company. And, and, you know, uh, ultimately that's like the bottom line. And, and if things don't work out, that's okay. Move on, say goodbye, go to a different company. Um, even, you know, family and friends, there's a line that you can cross with someone who, that like hey we can't be around each other anymore like you know families get broken up i'm sure many of us have experienced that uh that that doesn't exist in our church family here that our church family is is for the long haul for eternity now there's certain times where church discipline comes into play and we're responsible to help correct people which could involve some separation for a time but it's always for the purpose of restoration always for the purpose of uh, people experiencing the love of God and uh, the, the love being between us. So, so our church, the core of our church, is built on these five blessings that we're leading, that, that we read about, that catch us when we fall. And so we can go about our Christian lives uh, confident and, and just full force, toward what we think God's calling us to do and where we trip and fall, our church is here to help catch us. So if we have these blessings from God, then that should motivate us to something very radical, which is church unity. Now our culture that we live in pushes hostility and division Our culture is all about the us versus them mindset. We're going to cut up our society in as many different ways as possible so that we can make distinctions between as many different people as possible so we can fight the other people or we can be better than the other people. This passage tosses that right out the door. As soon as you drive into the parking lot of our church, that, that stuff gets left out on the street. Here in this church, we're just an us. There's no us versus them. We're just an us. We're just this church family. Verse 2 says that if we have received these blessings from God, we are now to be like-minded. We're now to be like-minded. Like-minded means sharing the same mind with one another. In the context of this church family, our church family is sharing the same mind with one another. Now, what does it look like to have the same mind? Well, verse 2 says that it looks like having the same love. That love that we just mentioned that's rooted in God himself. That's the love that we're sharing together. An example of having the same love is, I'm sure you've experienced this, where it feels like you're you're trying to compete with someone for caring for the other person. You know, well, let me get that door for you. No, 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 let me get that door for you. Or, or, or here, let me get you a cup of coffee. No, let me get you a cup of coffee. Or here, let me buy you lunch. No, let me buy you lunch. So you're fighting over the check, right? That kind of love that you experience, having the same love. You both want to love each other equally, and, and, and that love is just abounding toward one another. Having the same mind looks like being of one accord, being co-spirited, sharing the same ideals, the same cares, the same values. An example of this is when you hear someone uh, talking passionate about something. You overhear them talking passionate about something, and you're like, hey, I'm passionate about that thing too, right? 
Uh, we, I just had this moment last Sunday. I was talking to someone who, who came up to me after church about church outreach, and they were talking so passionate about church outreach. And here walks someone else I know who is also uh, passionate about church outreach coming right c- right around the corner. I'm like, hey, you got to get in on this conversation. And then they start talking. They're like, yeah, I've been talking about that all all for months. I've, I've been dying to do that. Yeah, let's get together. All that passion because they, they heard the other person talking about it. Being of one accord. Being, being in the same mind looks like sharing the same understanding, sharing the same wisdom, sharing the same judgment and thoughts as each other. Even, yeah, even thoughts, saying, sharing the same thoughts. An example of this is when someone's explaining something and you feel like they're explaining the way you think better than you could. Like, oh, you took, you took the words out of my brain. I couldn't, I couldn't formulate that as well, but you like really understand what, what I'm thinking. Now, all of this like-mindedness is such a foreign idea to us that we read this passage and we immediately start trying to qualify what this means. Like, yeah, like-minded is good, but like to a certain extent, you know, we start trying to qualify, limit the like-mindedness that we're comfortable with. Or we start just kind of tuning out at this point thinking, oh yeah, this sounds really nice in theory, but I can't imagine being that connected to the people in my church or even we just straight up disagree with the passage and we're like yeah I just don't want to be that close with my church like my church can I just need some space from the people in my church so all of those things might come in to play because this idea of like-mindedness is so foreign to us this passage is not suggesting that we become like brainwashed robots who just follow the crowd and do whatever everybody else in our church is doing. This passage is is actually saying the exact opposite of that. This passage is suggesting that we are so thoughtful and so engaged in our church that we experience these certain blessings from God in the midst of our trials, and it moves us to a deeper and deeper understanding of God where we align with each other at church. To put all that more simply, is we seek God's heart and mind so much that we end up having the same heart and mind as each other. We seek God's heart and mind so passionately, so much, that we end up having the same heart and mind as each other here at church. A few months ago, I went to visit a buddy out of state, and we we roomed in college, so we get along really well, and and we're always very in sync. Um, But living out of state, you don't get to talk as much, and so, you know, you're not as much on the same page. So the first night I was there, we stayed up till 4 a.m. debating some, like, church politics stuff, you know, like how the church works and stuff like that. So we stayed up till 4 a.m. all night. We're just debating back and forth only to find out at about 4 a.m. that we basically think the same thing. We were just using different words and coming from a different perspective, and and, uh, it was like kind of a misunderstanding (laughs) the whole time. Uh, But but we would have never figured that out if at 10 p.m. we were like, uh, well, I don't care about you anymore then. You were different. Before you moved out of California, you were different. Now... Now, now I don't know who you are anymore. You know, if we if we broke it off early in the night, we would have thought we were on completely different sides and been frustrated. But we we worked through that problem with love for one another and, and came to the conclusion that in the end, yeah, we're we're like minded. We understand each other. Now, in the church, we can expect for there to be disagreement, many, many, many disagreements in the church. And left to our own devices, that's the end of it. But we need to part ways. That we need to go to a different church because we disagree. But using the unity that God has given us, we can actually work through that disagreement and get to a deeper understanding of each other, deeper understanding of the perspective we're coming from, and and that deeper understanding, that actually helping each other. Think of it this way. The more that we're like-minded with one another, the more we can be confident that we're on the right path. If we respect the faithfulness of each other as followers of Christ, 
we're all trying to follow Christ, we're all trying to know the mind of God and follow the Lord, then if there's a disagreement between two of us, there's some disconnect there because there's no disagreement in the mind of God, meaning one of us or both of us, probably almost definitely both of us, are, are off the path, don't quite understand what God is calling us to or, or don't quite understand the truth of God. So if us, you and I, working through our disagreement together, lovingly, getting to unity helps us actually identify the truth of God. So disagreement in the church is not, it's not even a bad thing. It's a helpful thing because together we get to lovingly work through that disagreement until we're like-minded, until we're on the same mind. And at the end of that, working through all of that, we're more confident that we're on the path that God has called us to because we're in agreement. We're witnesses. We're, we're, we're followers of Christ together that, that both agree this is the path that God wants for us in our life. So we work hard as a church family to work through those disagreements to find that like-minded unity, and we're better off because of it. Now, being of the same mind with our church family is a lot to ask of us. But verses 3 and 4 reveal how we accomplish that. Verse 3 instructs us to do nothing, to do nothing with selfish ambition having no goals for ourselves to get ahead. We have zero goals to get ourselves ahead. An example is we don't think of church or other people from the perspective of what we can gain from it. We don't think of church or other people from the perspective of what we think we can gain from it. I don't come to church because I think I'm going to get something from church today. I don't go to someone else or I'm not friends with someone in the church because I think what I can gain from them, how much encouragement I can get from them, how much help I can get from them. I'm not going to others to get myself ahead. I have no selfish ambition. Verse 3 goes, well, and just to be clear, I wasn't just claiming that I have no selfish ambition because unfortunately I do, but I was saying that was the goal. You guys are my safety net. You'll catch me. So... Verse 3 goes on to instruct us to do nothing with conceit. Conceit creating conflict that results in vain glory or empty pride. An example of this is we don't try to prove others wrong just for the sake of being right. Just so that they admit that we had the right perspective all along. We don't care about that. It's empty pride. Who cares? Vain glory. All right, I was right on one point. Great. So I have no selfish ambition, no conceit. Instead of these things, we are to do everything with a lowliness of mind, with humility, with modesty, understanding our place. Now remember, humility is not putting ourselves down. Humility is knowing who we are. And knowing who we are in relation to God, knowing that who we are is extremely valuable, objectively, but also small compared to the greatness of God at the same time. An example of this is seeing ourselves as valued in this church. Each and every one of you who are here, everyone who considers this your church home, your church family, you're extremely valued here. But none of us are irreplaceable. All of us are valued. None of us are irreplaceable. The Lord can bring other people to the church. They can they can get other people to do what we're doing. But all of us are extremely valued here. You see that balance. In our humility, we consider our brothers and our sisters in Christ more important than ourselves. We consider the other people sitting next to us more important than ourselves. An example of this is that we seek to give others the best that we have. And we seek to give others the best that the church has to give. To be clear, verse 4 presupposes 
that we are taking care of ourselves, and that is a good thing. Again, this verse isn't telling us to starve ourselves so that everybody else can eat. This verse presupposes we're taking care of ourselves. But we're also called to take care of others even better. So so we're making sure we have what we need, but we're making sure everybody else has even more than what they need. We're caring about them even more. We're valuing them even more. Now, our motivation for all of this is our love for one another. But you could also go as far to say that when we consider others more important than ourselves, we end up more satisfied. When we bring others joy, we end up with more joy. My first and strongest memory of loving church. Uh, see, I, I, I really hated church for a long time. Uh, church is boring, and every pastor is boring was my perspective. So uh, disliking church for a long time. I can remember the first time I just loved church and, and just wanted to be at church as much as I could. And the first and strongest memory of that, of loving church and wanting to be at church, wasn't sitting in a church service because remember, all pastors are born. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, going to a church event or, or winning the ugly sweater contest or anything like that. My first and strongest memory of loving church was running around the church trying to, get as mi- to, to empty as many of the trash cans as I could, as fast as I could, so that nobody else had to empty trash that day, and trying to vacuum as many of the rooms as I could after church uh, so that nobody else had to vacuum any of the mo- any of the rooms that day, and it, the more I could get done without anybody having to do any of it, everybody else in the church being able to just not empty trash or not vacuum, the happier I was. And and, and that's my first memory of loving church. <laughs> just this past Friday night at our youth Christmas party, during one of during the study, one of the kids brought up the importance of being an active part of the church body. And our men's and women's studies have both recently discussed this topic as well. Because God designed Christians to function on this earth through the local church. That's how he set up how Christians and how his kingdom would function on earth. And God designed the local church to function by Christians loving and serving one another. So we're made or we're renewed Our life as Christians is intended, is designed to be here in our local church. And this local church is designed for us to love and care and serve one another. When we treat others in our church as more important than ourselves, it ends up becoming a blessing back to us as well. And each of us are doing that for each other, so... You take care of someone else here, and someone else will take care of you here. So the main point of our study this morning is that we will experience our loving church family here by being of one mind with one another and by putting others before ourselves. We're going to experience our church family here. Remember, Jesus' perspective was that his eternal family was even more joyful for him, even more important to him, in the family he was born into. We experience our, you know, our, our eternal family is all Christians through all time, but our local expression of that is this church. This is, this is our small piece of that eternal family. So we experience that, that loving family of God here in this church by working together to be of one mind with one another and by putting each other before ourselves. We read in Luke chapter 22, the disciples are at the Last Supper arguing about who's going to be the greatest among them, who's going to be the greatest disciple. And Jesus says in verse 26, On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. In John 13, Jesus goes on to say, By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This church being a loving family 
That is our calling card. That's how people know us. Because we're a loving family here at Calvary Stockton. So this upcoming year, let's let all of Stockton know us by our love for one another. Amen? Let's pray. Father, uh, we first gained this love from you. We know no love apart from you. But we've received the, the truest and most complete love in how you've saved us, how you've made us and saved us and called us to yourself. And Lord, help us learn that love from you and express that love to those around us. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second, if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, you've heard us talk about what that means to us in the form of this, this family that we're a part of, this family of God that we're a part of. An amazing family here that loves each other, and when we mess up, we love each other even more. If you want to be a part of this family, if you want the mistakes you've made in your life to be forgiven by Jesus, if you want to accept eternal life from God, if you want to give your life to Jesus so you can be a part of this, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray with you to give your life to God. Amen. Amen. Does anybody else want to be included in this prayer? Those of you who raised your hands, let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for these who have heard about your love for them. They've heard you this morning invite them to a relationship with you where they can give their lives to you. Live by your truth, live by your love, and be part of the family that we all experience here. Father, I pray that they believe in the death of Jesus and believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. If they proclaim that Jesus is God, they devote their lives to God, ask for forgiveness, and, and ask to receive eternal life with you. And, and Lord, I pray that you answer their prayer right now by granting those things to them. That we can rejoice with all the angels in heaven as they have received new life. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer, if you've already trusted in Jesus, or even if you trust in Jesus today. And the Lord has spoken to you about our church family here. Has spoken to you about the love that we share that catches us when we fall. Has spoken to you about working through disagreements in order to have like-minded relationship with, with your brothers and sisters here. And if the Lord has spoken to you about putting others in this church above yourself and serving them, if the Lord has spoken to you about those things, I'd love to pray with you. If you want to raise your hand. Amen. 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 Anybody else want to be included in this prayer? Father, I thank you for these who are raising their hands because you have spoken to them about the grace that they receive from you and from our church, about how they desire to be of one mind with, with the rest of their family here, about how they desire to serve their family by putting their family 
above themselves here. We thank you for the, the gift of this grace and this love and for the encouragement of our family here and, and Lord, for the birth of Jesus, our Savior. We pray all this in Jesus' name and we rejoice in you, God. Amen.